Since the Second World War, the ultimate security of the United States has depended on the awesome destructive power of its strategic nuclear forces to deter thermonuclear war. The strength of this deterrence was based on the calculation that we would inflict terrible destruction in retaliation for a nuclear attack. This doctrine of assured destruction is dependent on the certainty in the mind of an aggressor that we have the will and ability to retaliate. To always maintain this ability, a sufficient portion of our strategic forces must be able to survive any nuclear exchange, even a surprise first strike. Whether America's strategic forces will continue to be able to survive such a disarming, preemptive attack is today a matter of increasing uncertainty. Oscar Control, trip 14-Oscar, on your access. Request entry, Captain Stanton, plus one. I'll vouch for the tank cross. Thank you, After Captain, lines two and four are in. Stand easy, please. How's everybody today? Good. Sir, this is the current world intelligence situation, and uh, you might pay particular note to the uh, nuclear submarines off the east and west coast. Okay. And then back here we have the situations that have changed uh, in the last 12 hours worldwide. Okay, I'll complete the review of those after we get airborne. Yes, sir. Confidence reporting. Missile warning, this is Beale. Stand by for confidence reporting. SSCO, no malfunction. Missile warning, no malfunction. Missile warning, this is Beale. Confidence is high. I repeat, confidence is high. I want to confirm, is this an exercise? Roger, copy. This is not an exercise. General, this is the senior controller at the command post. We have a warning message that requires your immediate presence. It's a command center with a warning conference, stand by. It's a command center with a warning conference, stand by. It's a command center with a warning conference, stand by. The system display for east is medium. We have predicted impacts 
of moderate count at this time. Hello, SAC warning controller. This is the Airborne. Uh, confirm inbound missiles on the U.S. Roger, understand. Major Reinhardt, we have 12 sea launch ballistic missiles inbound on the U.S. now. You gonna go out with me tomorrow night? Oh, I thought maybe we'd check out the Hacienda and uh, have a dinner or something. Might even let you treat. <laughs> you don't mind, do you? Hey, I gotta go. Stand by to copy the message. Stand by. Follows Alpha 7 8 November Foxtrot. Oh, wow. You're the guy that can't run the checklist. Uh, right. <laughs> Sir, we've just received a message from the SAC Underground Command Post putting all the SAC Force crews in their aircraft with their engines started. Coochie's waiting for us. Okay, go. man. I got the key. Okay, do you have your key? Yes, sir. Roger, I understand. Major Reinhardt, we have a massive attack against the U.S. net at this time. ICBMs. Numerous ICBMs. Clear ground. Extra post checked on. Stand by to start. Okay, get them, get them up. Two and eight are up. Good fire. Rotate the position. Okay, we're good. Good fire. 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 General, the SAC Underground just initiated a positive control launch message. It appears that they uh, discontinued the message halfway through, or there's a detonation, or they've been destroyed. Stand by. Message follows. Alpha, Tango, Golf, Lima. Sir, based on the initial launch call and the uh, bombers and missiles that destroyed, these are the targets that we now have uncovered and no longer have weapons against them. X-ray, five, stand by. Message follows. That's a JCS Delta. execution from the president. X-ray. So, step one, launch case inserted. Roger. Let's enable the missiles. Program Roger. select switch. Enable. Football. LFO. Unlock code inserted. Stand by. Unlock code inserted. Enable switch. Enable. Enable. Thirty-four minutes into the attack, the strategic forces of the United States have suffered a crippling blow. Of the 1,000 Minuteman missiles, only 46 remain operational. Of the 330 B-52 bombers, all but 22 have been destroyed on the ground. Of the 41 ballistic missile submarines, 17 have been destroyed in port, and an unknown number are presumed lost at sea. The attack has been restricted to strategic military targets. Eight million Americans are dead. The United States is given an ultimatum. Any attempt at retaliation will result in the certain annihilation of America's urban population. Nine minutes later, the president orders all surviving U.S. forces to cease fire. Although the likelihood of a surprise Soviet attack on the United States is very remote, the growing possibility of such an attack being successful undermines our policy of deterrence 
and brings closer the risk of nuclear war. Our bomber and missile forces were designed and built in the 1950s and 60s to be secure against the threat from the relatively small and inaccurate Soviet missile force that existed at that time. Today, the United States is confronted by a Soviet missile force that is massive and highly accurate. It is now conceded that an attack on our Minuteman missiles would result in the destruction of 90% of that force. The consequences of this development are grave and far-reaching. We always did expect to be in this position if we didn't modernize our forces. We didn't expect to be this soon, and we expected to have modernized our forces faster than we did. Some 15 years ago, the United States decided to exercise a policy of self-restraint in our strategic force programs, hoping that we would induce reciprocal self-restraint on the part of the Soviet Union. And from that, strategic arms limitations would be reached. The idea then was that the more we did in our strategic forces, uh, the more we'd force the other side to do, whereas the less we did, then the less they would have to do. Now, in pursuing this uh, policy of self-restraint, we forgot the second half of the, of the proposition, and that was the minimum we must do is assure always that our forces are thoroughly survivable against any scenario of, to use Harold Brown's words, even a well-executed surprise attack. The Soviets, in contrast to the United States, over the last 15 years have been serious about defense. They have been deadly serious about defense. At the moment, they are not only uh, procuring more defense hardware than the United States by 90 or 100 percent, they are outspending the entire free world in the area of military investment. And one must assume that they have some calculation and some motive for that behavior. The Soviet Union now has the ability to deliver a nuclear warhead within 600 feet of a Minuteman silo. It is this accuracy, combined with the destructive power of the thousands of nuclear warheads in the Soviet arsenal, that has made our land-based missiles vulnerable. A sound deterrent must be based upon the proposition that no major component of our deterrent forces is vulnerable. Otherwise, we've lost the ability to enforce stability in a crisis or at any other time. But the ICBM force is unique because it carries with it particular properties that are essential to carrying out a reasonable strategy of limited strikes against hard targets. It's the ICBM force, and only the ICBM force, that's capable of threatening Soviet time-urgent hardened targets. The submarine force isn't accurate enough, and the bomber force isn't rapid enough. Therefore, knowing this, the vulnerability in the ICBM force seems to me to be the most destabilizing possibility that we can face in the 1980s. To design your land-based missile forces so that they are capable of withstanding a surprise attack from four or 5,000 Soviet ICBM warheads is a very substantial undertaking. And it takes a, a system of the scope and the complexity of the MX to do that. We've looked at dozens of alternative ways of doing it. We know of other ways of doing it, but they are all either more complex, more expensive than MX, or they are not technically feasible, they do not really provide the reduction in vulnerability. The MX missile is to depend for its survival on a multiple protective shelter basing system. Each missile would have 23 shelters, between which the missile would be periodically shuttled. Because of the uncertainty as to which shelter contained the missile, all 23 would have to be attacked to be sure of destroying one missile. Such an attack is considered too costly for the Soviets to undertake. While the controversy surrounding this system has mainly concerned its great cost and environmental impact, a more urgent consideration is how soon it could be available. That system won't begin its deployment until 1986. It won't complete it until 1989. So during the 80s, we will not have the ability to withstand a surprise attack on our land-based missiles. And that is a problem, and that does increase the risk. 
there is an interim solution that the U.S. has worked on for many years and has found technically feasible. And that is to take the existing Minuteman III missile, canisterize it, modify it so that it can be easily moved from one location to another, build many silos for each individual Minuteman III missile. This would require much greater resources on the Soviets' part to destroy the land-based missiles and would certainly give a great deal of survivability to the land-based missile force. This could have been done by now and could certainly be done by the mid-1980s with the Minuteman III missile because the missile already exists and doesn't have to be developed from scratch. There's fundamentally nothing wrong with expanding the Minuteman deployment, building several thousand more shelters in the Minuteman fields and having a deceptive basing system with a Minuteman system. But it is an illusion to think that that would happen any quicker or any cheaper or be in any way superior to the MX program. The latest estimates show that the MX system would cost $50 billion. Why is that? Only about a fifth of that would be the missile. The rest is the deployment scheme, the shelters, the transporters, the tracks, the roads, and so on. Why all that? Well, on the one hand, you want to have the missile hidden, concealed, so that the Russians do not know where it is, so they cannot target it, attack it with their missile warheads. On the other hand, because the government still thinks that there will be a SALT treaty in the future. For the purposes of SALT, they want to have the missile to be seen and verifiable. That's why you have these complex shelters with sliding roofs that can be opened and closed and so on. You're trying to square a circle. You're trying to have a missile which is invisible so that it will be safe and visible so that it can be counted for arms control. You try to do the two and it costs you $50 billion. If we look at any one system in isolation, including the MX, uh, we can design ways of destroying that system. The way that we protect our deterrent is by having multiple systems, all of which have certain advantages as well as certain disadvantages. And the composite of those systems provides us with adequate deterrence. We are going to need the MX. Uh, one has. Uh, questions about the particular mode of deployment, but it is far more important for the United States to redress the strategic arms balance than to indulge in a five or ten year debate about the ideal mode of deployment. America evolved a so-called triad of strategic forces after the Second World War. Bombers, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and nuclear submarines which could launch missiles while safely submerged. It has been suggested that we abandon our vulnerable land-based missiles and rely on submarines and bombers only. This might be possible if it were not for inherent limitations and potential problems facing these forces. The bomber force, in my view, is at least as vulnerable to a first strike as is the ICBM force. It's highly concentrated, the alert rates are very low, and Soviet advances in technological capability have put that force into jeopardy in the time frame every bit as much as the ICBM force. In the event of a surprise attack, it will take many minutes for the alert crews to reach their airplanes, start engines, take off, and fly far enough away to escape destruction. Most of our bombers and tankers are based in coastal areas in short range of submarine-launched missiles. It is doubtful that many aircraft would escape in the five to eight minutes it would take the missiles to reach these bases. The 70% not on alert would certainly be lost. An interim solution to give our aircraft more time to get off the ground would be to move them farther inland to the center of the continent. It would take submarine-launched missiles five to ten minutes longer to reach these interior bases, giving the bombers more time to escape. It's certainly true that the Soviets could launch an attack that either now or in the relatively near future would eliminate the great bulk of the ICBM force. It could also eliminate the non-alert bombers. I think it's very doubtful that they could eliminate both the bulk of the bombers and the bulk of the ICBM force in a, because of problems of making that attack simultaneous. And in any event, they couldn't eliminate the submarine force. So that we're talking about not the vulnerability, the whole deterrent, 
we are in effect talking about the vulnerability of an important part of the deterrent. The synchronization of such an attack is a uh, technical difficulty that a military planner would have to deal with. And indeed it's difficult, but it's not impossible. The uh, different kinds of missiles fly at different uh, speeds. They fly at different altitudes. The techniques by which we try to detect these things are themselves based on vulnerable points of large radars at various places. A disarming attack is technically possible, although probably not perfectly achievable. But perfection isn't required. If the United States sustained a surprise attack that resulted in the loss of most of its ICBMs, bombers, and submarines in port, the 25 or more nuclear missile submarines on patrol would certainly remain a powerful force, but a force of restricted usefulness. The depths they rely on for protection also make communication with them extremely difficult. Because their missiles are relatively inaccurate, they can be used only for attacking unprotected military targets and cities. It is a force of last resort that could become vulnerable. As the Soviet Union improves their technology in submarine detection, we may be facing a problem with uh, submarine vulnerability towards the end of the century. So we need to anticipate that, and the way to anticipate it and to prepare for it is to fix the problem in our land-based missiles by then. It would be a new type of folly to rely exclusively on our submarines and upon submarine-borne missiles. In the first place, the submarine force is basically usable only for city busting. And the United States, along with the Soviet Union, should be eager to avoid the destruction of urban areas. Uh, the capacity of our submarine forces uh, to do pinpoint targeting is quite limited, to say the least. And that is the reason that we must retain the ICBMs in the force structure. But more significantly, if one becomes dependent upon any single arm, such as submarines, the Soviets can devote a much higher percentage of their budget to solving their problems of anti-submarine warfare. The new cruise missile is being offered as a crutch to help us through our period of ICBM vulnerability. The cruise missile is essentially a small pilotless aircraft which can be armed with a nuclear warhead. It is a technology that holds great promise for America's strategic forces. B-52 bombers will be equipped to carry 20 cruise missiles which could be launched far from the borders of the Soviet Union. It is believed that such a saturation attack by two to 3,000 missiles would overwhelm the Soviet air defenses. Flying at 600 miles per hour, 200 feet above the ground, the 1,800-mile range missile would be extremely difficult to detect or shoot down. The cruise missile matches the features of the terrain below it with a digital map that it carries in its onboard computer to find its way to target with unerring accuracy. The cruise missiles may augment the bomber force, indeed they will, assuming that the bomber force carrying the cruise missiles is survivable, both on the ground prior to launch and en route to target. Those cruise missiles are not exceptionally long-range cruise missiles, so the carriers for them are going to have to come very close to and probably even penetrate, to some extent, Soviet air defenses. They're an improvement. They're hardly an answer to the bomber force difficulties, there's no answer at all to the ICBM force difficulties. Present plans are to use 150 of these B-52s as cruise missile carriers. The remaining 180 B-52s will be expected to fly to their targets. How much longer we can rely on this aircraft, even in the cruise missile role, is a matter of concern. There's a pretty high level of interest in the Air Force and a new man bomber, but I'd want to distinguish between a airplane that would be capable of penetrating modern active air defenses and an airplane whose only function would be to deliver cruise missiles from the exterior of the uh, air defense system. Those are quite, two quite different functions. Now the B-52 is, as it's being outfitted now as a cruise missile carrier, will be quite capable of performing that latter function, a cruise missile launcher, well into the 90s. 
They say, the B-52s are good till 1995. Then you go to them and say, look, these aircraft were designed in the 1940s, were built in the 50s. The last one came off the production line in 62, the end of 1961. How are these bombers going to be functioning 25 years after the event? How, I mean, uh, it is, uh, you're trying to operate highly complex aircraft 25 years old. No airline would try to maintain service. And here they are trying to penetrate a formidable Soviet air defenses with between three and 4,000 fighter aircraft, 12,000 air-to-ground missiles, operate thousands of radars. They're trying to do it with these very old aircraft on the grounds that their technical studies show it can still be done. This is not how a serious military power proceeds. When the B-52 bomber was ordered in the early 50s, the Air Force thought it would be replaced in a decade or so by a follow-on, more modern aircraft. The B-1 was to be such a replacement. It is the most capable bomber in the world. The B-1 uses extremely advanced engines and a variable sweep wing to carry twice the payload greater distances at much higher speed than the B-52. In 1977, with the cost per airplane approaching $100 million, plans to build 241 B-1s were canceled. The new cruise missile technology seemed to offer a cheap alternative, but the cruise missile must be carried by an airplane which can safely get off the ground and fly close enough to release its cruise missiles. The B-1 was designed to do this. Its quick response, short takeoff, rapid acceleration, and hardness against nuclear blast effects makes it many times more likely to survive a surprise attack than the B-52. Flying at treetop altitudes, 600 miles per hour, the B-1 is very difficult to detect with radar or shoot down. As a cruise missile carrier or penetrator, the B-1 remains the soonest and best hope the U.S. has for an advanced manned weapon delivery system in the 80s. The Soviet Union already has 200 similar bombers, the backfire, against which we have little defense. We dismantled the last of our air defenses in 1975 on the argument that since we had had an ABM treaty and we were defenseless against missiles, uh, what difference did it make if we were also defenseless against bombers? We have a token air defense, what they call enough for control of the sovereignty of the air. We're still using six squadrons of F-106 interceptors, which are late 50s technology, most of them manned by the reserve. I should also add that there's a very formidable Soviet bomber force. And they're going to have a free ride. They can roam the country either after a missile exchange or instead of a missile exchange, and attack or threaten to attack more or less at will. If we deployed some modern interceptors, some F-14s or 15s, both of them are very good, under the control of AWACS aircraft, the new airborne warning and control system, we could have a very significant air defense. The radar net, while it's old, is fairly good at higher altitudes. At lower altitudes, there are gaps. But it does present an avenue where a manned bomber, high speed, in small numbers, could penetrate uh, without warning. And it gives him another alternative. Uh, we're talking, of course, about the backfire bomber. But it applies equally as well to the Baron Bison aircraft, or, or more seriously to the aircraft he's developing at this time. He's working hard. He's got a B-1. He's got uh, plans. He's thinking in terms of the aircraft that would follow these, these particular uh, current operational models. So it also poses a very real threat. The Soviets, in all probability, have the capacity to knock out our Minuteman system. Nobody knows for sure, including the Soviets, because no one has ever practiced an attack of this sort. There have been all sorts of tests, but there have, has never been any operational experience, and we hope that it remains that way. The Soviet leaders should bear in mind, of course, that while they may have the capacity to attack and destroy our Minuteman system, if we ride out the attack, that they can never even be sure of that. 
and they should never be given assurance that the United States would simply ride out an attack. The reason it's important that they not have in their mind that they might succeed in such an attack has to do with what their ambitions are. What is it that they really would like to achieve? They would like to separate the United States from its European allies. They would like to neutralize and circle communist China. They would like to expand their influence and get to a position of control over the Persian Gulf. If they control the Persian Gulf, then they can dictate where the energy supplies of the Persian Gulf go. They can then, that will support their policy of dividing European NATO from the United States, of encircling China by neutralizing Japan and Southeast Asia. And it will also have a bearing on what happens in the African continent. So that their entire policy and our entire policy may depend upon what happens in the Middle East. The rest of the world has recognized that since 1945, the balance of power has been maintained by the United States. None of our allies, the former great powers like Britain, Germany, are in a position to do that. Only the United States has the power to serve as a counterweight to the Soviet Union. And as our military capacity has flagged, and more importantly, as we have been perceived to be vacillating on foreign policy issues, our allies and the third world nations have begun to make adjustments in their position. They have begun to consider accommodations with the Soviet Union. And as a consequence, our position worldwide can deteriorate rapidly even in the absence of an attack on the United States directly. People look at the United States and say, um, to what extent are they concerned about displeasing the United States? They look at the Soviet Union and, and ask themselves, to what extent can they afford to provoke the Soviet Union? Then they're faced with a des decision. Every day, something comes up. Do we boycott the Olympics or we don't boycott the Olympics? On, on the invasion of Afghanistan? Uh, do we speak for or against the Soviet Union at the United Nations debate? Do we give trade concessions to the Americans or the Russians? And when they make these decisions, they look at the power of each, and on the basis of their perception of the strength of each side, their feeling of it, on that basis they decide. The outer world recognizes that the Soviet political system has been a failure. The only asset that the Soviet Union has is military power. They recognize that. In the absence of the employment of the threat of that military power, the free world will win in the long run. People have seen us going downhill, downhill, downhill. First of all, we have to at least give them the feeling that we can recover. Second, we have to put substance into this by going back to a serious effort in terms of raising our military strength. We're now spending five and a bit percent of our GMP. We're competing against the Soviet Union that is spending much more than that in absolute terms, in real terms. We have to go back competing again. That means more money. I think it means conscription, young people in the service, so we get value for our money. And it will mean, of course, a variety of weapon programs. The third thing we have to do is that in the interim period, when we move from weakness to strength, we have to be very careful. Because the temptation upon the Soviet Union to intervene, to prevent us from recovering, to prevent us from reestablishing a, a, a deterrence and a balance of power, the temptation will be very great. I don't see the Russians as, as Nazis. The Russians are not Nazis. They're not, they don't relish war and so on. But, if we do recover and start moving back towards recovery, there will be a great temptation for them to try and stop us. When the U.S. forces become vulnerable, the Soviets will know that as well as the U.S. will know it. And the Soviets may read that as an inclination on the part of the U.S. to strike first, rather than to wait for the Soviets to attack 
and leave nothing surviving in the U.S. strategic forces. Uh, this contributes to strategic nuclear instability, to a greater incentive on the part of all sides to try to attack first. And the last thing you want in this world is any incentive for a country to attack with nuclear forces presumptuously, preemptively, quickly. <laughs>